this particular topic. And um, the topic is today the cycle of the year, the holidays and observances of the Jewish of the Jewish year. Let me just uh, begin uh, by uh, by posing a question: Is there any um, oh, too many technical details here? Is there any question that arose from your uh, from your listening to last year's recording or from your reading about uh, the cycle of the Jewish year. Let's begin with a question to launch the conversation. Of course, you first need to unmute yourself if you have a question. <clears throat> no questions, I presume it's all perfectly clear, so we uh, don't need to proceed. Um, I do. I've read I've read a couple of different books and, you know, this, this gets covered in almost every Judaism class I've taken so far. Um, but one thing that one thing that's still kind of a mystery to me is how the extra month of Adar works. I know we have one coming up, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a good question because it launches a conversation into the Jewish calendar and we have uh, at least one of the handouts that you can access in our website is dedicated uh, to that explanation. And it's not as complicated as it might um, sound. It's actually quite simple. Um, think of the calendar that we use for our uh, civil and secular lives. It has 12 months and uh, the months are either 30 or 31 days with the exception of February, which is 28 days. And in a leap year, every four years is 29 days. If you add all those numbers together, it gives us 365 days to the civil calendar. 365 and a quarter would be the perfect uh, answer. And that's why we have to adjust it every four years with the extra February, right? The Jewish calendar operates on a different basis. The civil calendar that we use is a solar calendar. That is the months are determined uh, by 12 uh, circumlocutions of uh, circumambulations of the earth uh, around the sun. That is 365 of those and then, and then divided. So the, the structure of the calendar is predicated on a solar earth relationship. The Jewish calendar, like other ancient calendars, begins with a lunar understanding of the month. In fact, that is what the word month means. Monaten is related to the concept of moon. So in the Jewish calendar, as well as in the Muslim calendar, a month is the time that it <clears throat> takes for the moon to complete a cycle around the earth. And that is <clears throat> about 29 days, 29 and a half days. If you add the number of days times 12 of that calendar, you end up with 350 Four. A lunar year is 354 days long. In the Muslim tradition, that's how it stays. And each month remains a lunar month, which means that the holidays and sacred seasons are not always at the same season. They either move forward or lack backward. That's why in the Muslim calendar, for example, Ramadan, which is their sacred fast season uh, of a month, can be in the spring, can be in the fall, can be in the summer, can be in the winter, as the cycles rotate. The Jewish calendar did not allow for that, because biblically, the major 
festivals of the year are described as seasonal holidays. So you have to have Passover in the spring and you have to have Sukkot in the fall. They are described as holy days of that season. Hence, in the Jewish tradition, we have an adjustment of the lunar calendar to the solar calendar. And that is done by means of that leap month. So in the civil calendar, you add a day to the calendar when you have a leap year every four years. In the Jewish calendar, you add a month to the calendar every so often, and the so often is seven times in 19 years, which means that every third year or so, approximately, you have a leap year. Leap year means one extra month. That month is designated as second Adar or Adar. So it's an extra month of Adar, which comes right before the beginning of the spring cycle, right? And uh, launches then, uh, uh, launches us forward uh, into a new year. This, this year, <clears throat> you will notice that many of the holidays uh, are a little bit early. Hence, for example, Hanukkah. When is Hanukkah this year? November 28th is the first day of Hanukkah, like right on top of Thanksgiving. Why? Because we have been lagging. Then this coming year, we're going to move it forward because we're going to have a leap year. And the next year, it'll be pushed back. <clears throat> what this allows is always to keep the major festivals in their due season. Otherwise, we would be totally out of season. It can be a little bit earlier, a little bit later in the season, but it's always Passover is always a spring festival. Sukkot and the High Holy Days are always fall festivals. Those are the two important ones that are seasonal. And uh, Shavuot, which is uh, seven weeks after Passover, and that's what the word Shavuot means, weeks, the festival of weeks, uh, remains then connected generally to the summer. And uh, that is our cycle. So the current Jewish calendrical system, which was finalized and established in the early centuries of the common era, around the fourth century, by a astronomer, rabbi, sage called Hillel II, not the famous Hillel of the first century before the common era. So the system of the calendar that we observe um, is actually a very, very accurate system in terms of the way that the year moves. And it takes into account both the lunar and the solar um, uh, system so that we remain connected both to the cycles of the moon. A new, a new Jewish month always begins with the new moon ends with the waning moon and then begins again the new moon. So the months are lunar and that's what the word month means. And in Hebrew, the word for a month is chodesh, which comes from the root chadash, which means new, as in new moon. Chodesh from the root chadash means new, the new Moon. So the Jewish calendar ends up in the full cycle of 19 years, having a perfect synchronicity with uh, the, um, <clears throat> not only with the civil calendar, but more accurate than, than the cycle of the civil calendar, which is, you know, uh, every year lagging a little bit, but the Hebrew year advances um, with that synchronicity of moon and sun. In the Muslim calendar, there is no solar adjustment. In the Jewish calendar, there is a solar adjustment. Reason, 
holidays are seasonal. They, Passover cannot happen in the winter. Passover is a spring holiday. In fact, another name for Passover in the Torah is the festival of spring. Hag Aviv. Aviv is spring. Does that clarify it a little bit? Well, there's, I do have one, one other question. Um, yeah. the, um, so in terms of commemorations, let's say a yard site for somebody who, who died in a second Adar, and you only have a second Adar every third year. Yeah. How, uh, how does that work? That's a good question. And it's done in different ways. Some people observe it on both Adars. Some people observe it on the Adar when it first happened. Meaning, if a person died in a non-leap year, so it's done on the on the uh, uh, on that Adar. Uh, so it's either you do it twice or you do it on the one that uh, that corresponds. But uh, there is no um, final word on that. There's different practice. That's all. Okay, so that part's flexible. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. okay. And right. So Adar brings us what holiday? Purim, right? The holiday of spring, Purim, the book of Esther. And Purim is observed on second Adar. There's a grid of the holidays in the in the in the handouts that you could look at it, um, and you can see the seasonal divisions of the of the holidays as they unfold. And uh, there you will get a little bit of a sense of how the Jewish calendar flows. Now, holidays and seasons are very here. This is the grid that I'm referring to. You have it in your in your handouts. We're not going to look at that now. You can take a look at that. Um, and um, it'll give you the explanation. What is the most important Jewish holiday or, or sacred day? Yom Kippur. Okay. Shabbat. Shabbat. It's actually Shabbat. And Yom Kippur is kind of a supreme Shabbat. It is referred to as Shabbat Shabbaton a Sabbath of Sabbaths, even when it doesn't occur on Shabbat, right? The word Shabbat biblically means a pause, a sacred pause. And what is the first reference to Shabbat? Of course, God's completion, or I hate to use the word completion because according to Jewish rabbinic interpretation, the word is not, the world is not completed. It's still in the process of creation, and we are co-creators with God. But on the sixth day, God, big picture, the blueprint was there. And according to the biblical narrative in the first chapter of Genesis, moving into the second chapter, God contemplated the seven, the six stages of creation and uh, decided that it was time to Shabbat, take a break. And that's what the word Shabbat means, to pause. In the Jewish tradition, this day is elevated to supreme importance. It is the first thing that is declared holy in the biblical tradition, okay? Holy means unique, distinct, set apart. To make holy or to sanctify, and the Hebrew root is kof dalet shin, kadosh, means to set something aside from the ordinary, meaning extraordinary. So all the days of the week are ordinary days. Shabbat is an extraordinary days. All the uh, months and weeks of the year are ordinary time. Sacred seasons, festivals, Pesach, are extraordinary times. We have relationships with people on a day-to-day -day basis. Those are ordinary relationships. Entering into a committed relationship, 
of marriage is a sacred partnership. Hence, the name for the marriage ceremony in the Jewish tradition, Kiddushin, to make holy, right? So moments of supreme importance, relationships of supreme importance, more so than places or locations are considered in the Jewish tradition sacred. Abraham Joshua Heschel, the great 20th century teacher, wrote a book called The Sabbath. And there he said that in the Jewish tradition, we build cathedrals in time, not cathedrals in space. So what is really sacred is time, the way we attend to it, and the relationships that we build to them. Seldom are things declared holy or sacred in the Jewish tradition. Although there is sacrality or sacredness that is applied to certain places as well. Okay, an important concept to, to keep in mind. Sacred means unique, distinct, set aside, as opposed to ordinary. It marks the extraordinary dimension of time, but yet an experienced one. Those of you who may be familiar with uh, uh, Martin Buber's philosophy, he tries to capture that in the distinction between I-it relationships and I-thou relationships. In an I-thou relationship, there is a, an elevation of the relationship from a utilitarian relationship, which is what we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. Right now, we're engaging in a utilitarian relationship despite the importance of the subject, meaning we have a subject matter, I am talking about it, you are listening to me, you're asking me questions, it is transactional relationship. Now, this relationship may translate or eventuate in a transcendent significance. But going to the supermarket, going to school, going to work, these are I-it relationships. I-thou is when the partners in a relationship enter into such a level of exchange that there is no longer any expectation of reward. Yet, the two do not merge or blend or meld. You remain in your distinctiveness, fully present for the other. That's an important distinction in Jewish mystical tradition from uh, many other mystical traditions. Uh, mystical traditions generally seems to speak about a, a blending, uh, a, a separation of boundaries, a uh, you know, everything becomes indistinguishable and mushed. The Jewish tradition, sacredness entails respect for the distinctiveness of the other and the uniqueness. And it is in that infinite respect that we attain sacredness. So I always find that a uh, very in interesting characteristic of, of the Jewish understanding of relationship. Yes, any other? So we have Shabbat as the supreme holy day. It occurs 52 times a week, right? Uh, in, a, in a full uh, solar calendar. Um, it is not tied to, it is and it isn't. Most of many of the holidays are tied to historical moments as well. Shabbat is cosmic. It is the creation of the world. We are supposed to rest in emulation of God's resting and taking a pause. So the pause between the notes, as a good musician would tell you, uh, a good composition is not just those black little notes, but the pauses in between. Those spaces are part of the art of the music. If you just had notes, da, 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 you wouldn't have music, you'd have noise. 
However, as uh, the biblical tradition unfolds, the experience of the exodus of redemption of the Israelites from Egypt is connected with the Sabbath experience. And in the Ten Commandments, occur in the book of Exodus and in the book of Deuteronomy, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, two different reasons are given for the observance of the Sabbath. In the book of Exodus, it's creation. Six days of creation, seven day pause. In the book of Deuteronomy, however, reflecting on the experience of Israel, the reason that it's associated with the Shabbat is not cosmic, but socio-moral. You shall rest, and, and all in your household shall rest. Even your servants shall rest. Why? Because you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and you know the heart of the slave, of the stranger. Everybody deserves a break. Everybody needs time to themselves because time is what makes us, what helps to make us fully who we are. So time is sanctified in the book of Deuteronomy in relationship with the remembrance of the exodus from bondage. So the experience of Shabbat now is elevated to a social moral dimension. And when we recite the Kiddush, when we raise the Kiddush cup on Shabbat to sanctify the day, we invoke both reasons. And we say that Shabbat is Kihu Yom Tehila Le Mikra E Kodesh, for this is the first of the days sanctified from the very beginning of creation. And also, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim, a remembrance to us of our redemption from bondage. From the word Mitzrayim in Hebrew, which means Egypt, comes from the root, which means the narrows. You are redeemed from the narrows, from the constraints, constraints. And that term is then associated with the experience of enslavement. Enslavement is constraint, inability to move physically at will, or to make your own decisions, to be bound by, by others physically, spiritually, emotionally. That's enslavement. So that's Shabbat. And we celebrate Shabbat by pausing, by prayer, by study, by fellowship, um, and uh, by taking note of, I think, essentially, the meaning of time. Shabbat is, is a, a moment to contemplate the meaning of the moment, the meaning of time. And then we have other holidays in the year. As we already pointed to, holidays are generally um, seasonally bound. After Shabbat, in the calendar of observance today, the two most distinctive uh, days in the Jewish calendar would be Yom Kippur, which is the Sabbath of Sabbaths, and the 10 days that come before Yom Kippur, which we refer to as Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. But if you look at the Torah, you will not find that name for the holiday. Rosh Hashanah is designated Rosh Hashanah post-biblically. In the Torah, Rosh Hashanah is simply referred to as a day of remembrance, a day of the blowing of the shofar, and it is also referred to as the first day of the seventh month. Now, how can Rosh Hashanah be the first day of the seventh month if we call it Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year? Any ideas about that? How come it's the beginning of the year if it's the first day of the seventh month? Because there's more than one New Year's in the Jewish calendar? Yes, there are in fact four according to the Mishnaic rabbinic tradition. But this particular holiday, 
which we regard as the main new year, is biblically right smack in the middle of the year. Why? Because biblically, the year began in the spring. In fact, it is said of the month when we observe Passover, Pesach, Hachodesh Hazeh, this month shall be unto you Rosh Hodashim, the head of the months. The month that today we call Nisan, and that is not because of a Japanese car manufacturer. Nisan is an ancient Babylonian term, is also referred to in the Bible as the month of Aviv, the month of spring, and that is the beginning of the biblical year. So the first holiday of the Jewish year, biblically, is Passover. It doesn't come on the first of, uh, of, uh, of the month. It comes in the middle of the month, the evening of the 14th and 15th. So Passover begins with the full moon, not with the new moon. So eventually, Rosh Hashanah, which is referred to in the Bible as the um, day of the sounding of the horn and the day of uh, <clears throat> the first day of the seventh month becomes Rosh Hashanah during the Babylonian period. Because in Babylonia, the fall was the time when the Babylonian pantheon and the Babylonian king were enthroned as supreme. So Jews who lived in the Babylonian world like we do, you know, they absorbed a lot of the customs and the practices and the vocabulary of the time, but they said, no, for us Jews, this will be the time when we enthrone our king, God, as the supreme king of kings. So the Babylonian uh, head of the pantheon was referred to as the king of kings. But in the Jewish liturgy, for the Rosh Hashanah observance especially, God is referred to as the king of the king of kings. It's a triple. It's a superlative. And that's how you express the superlative in Hebrew, generally by a double repetition of the word. Uh, so Shir Hashirim, which we translate as Song of Songs, means the supreme song. Shabbat Shabbaton, two times Shabbat, means a supreme Shabbat. But when it comes to God, in the reference to the pantheon, to the Babylonians, God is not the king of kings. God is the king of the king of kings. That's a super superlative. And uh, so the as time unfolds, Rosh Hashanah becomes the supreme New Year, also a cosmic observance. There is no historic event linked to Rosh Hashanah. It's all about creation and the world. In fact, when we say that we're in the year 5782 right now, according to rabbinic calculation, that is 5782 since the creation of the world. Carl Sagan would object to that. And modern science, we would all agree, would teach us differently. But in the rabbinic imagination, that is um, when it all began. And even if we don't agree that that's astronomically and uh, cosmologically when the world began, 6,000 years ago is about the time of the birth of consciousness of civilization. In Mesopotamia, in Egypt, this is when writing begins to develop and, and becomes more accessible. So it might not be the dawn of the physical universe, but it is the dawn of consciousness, the dawn of history, the dawn of self-reflection. And that is what the season becomes. It becomes a season of self-reflection, which then leads to Yom Kippur, 10 days after. And Yom Kippur is referred to in the Bible uh, by that term, Yom HaKippurim, a day of atonement, a day of uh, uh, which leads in the Jewish tradition to a personal renewal of self. So it's observed by fasting, by abstentions, 
by, uh, by focusing inward. Um, the, the biblical expression is a day of the affliction of the soul. But the word soul in the Bible doesn't mean what we think it means today, soul or some kind of ethereal notion. It means self. It is a time to kind of, of inward uh, examination of reflection on, on self. So it becomes then the day of atonement, the day of forgiveness, and it acquires that significant connotation. So Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, 10 days in the fall that are that point to the to the recreation of the world and the recreation of the self. That is the theme of this season. The days in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are referred to as the 10 days of Teshuvah, which is a Hebrew word which means return, renewal re-examination. It's usually translated as repentance, but that's uh, an incomplete meaning. Okay, so we have Shabbat, we have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and then we go into the three major festivals of the Jewish year, which are seasonal, right? Um, since we are on Yom Kippur, I'm going to follow the calendar from the fall, and we have Sukkot. Sukkot is often referred to as tabernacles because we build those booths. Those booths are associated with the pilgrimage of the Israelites through the desert after uh, leaving Egypt. But the way that we build them, it's unlikely that that's what they did. So they built tents, like Bedouin tents, right? But today we build the booth according to the agricultural meaning of the holiday, because Sukkot is the festival of the harvest of the first fruits. So those booths are agricultural huts, as the farmers would go out into the fields to gather the produce. They would stay overnight. They didn't come back home. Remember, uh, you couldn't catch the bus, or you uh, uh, you you didn't just hop on your car. You lingered out there with your donkeys and um, camels if they were already in the Middle East. The, cam the, the notion of the Middle East filled with camels is a uh, incorrect notion. It's the donkey that was the uh, animal of work and transportation. The cam camel comes in a little bit later. So our ancestors were donkey nomads. Uh, our patriarchs and matriarchs. So Sukkot is a festival of thanksgiving for the harvest. So now the yield of the earth in the fall. And there are several harvests, right? So there is the, the fall harvest, and that is Sukkot. The word Sukkot means huts, because we build a sukkah. Uh, but it is, it is known <clears throat> as a festival of, <clears throat> of the harvest of the of the of the fruit, uh, it's known as Hag Ha'asif, the festival of the ingathering. It's also referred to as Zaman Simchatein, the season of our joy. It was a very happy time. Uh, people, you know, fruits, food, carnivals. I mean, not carnivals in the sense that uh, Purim becomes a carnivalist, but big time of celebration. So much so that in the rabbinic period, Sukkot is simply referred to as Hag, the festival, the festival. So fall was a big time. And then we begin to move into the rest of the week. And um, it was a celebration of fertility. The seventh day of Sukkot is called Hoshana Rabbah. And it's about waters, waters flowing that, that nourish the land. And uh, it was a great feast of, of celebration. Um, in fact, in the, in the rabbinic literature, it says, he who has not witnessed the celebration of the, of the waters has never witnessed joy in his life. So happy time. Uh, in latter times, um, the last day of Sukkot, which is known as Shmini Atzeret, the eighth day of ingathering, 
becomes associated with a festival for the completion and renewal of the reading of the Torah. And we call that Simchat Torah. In Israel and in our community and in many diaspora communities, it is done together with the day of Shmini Atzeret on the eighth day of Sukkot. Among some Orthodox and conservative communities, it is done as an additional day. So Sukkot, instead of being seven day Sukkot, one day Shmini Atzeret, becomes a nine day rather than an eight day festival. And we'll see the same thing happen in the spring when Passover arrives. In Hebrew, Passover is called to, is referred to as Pesach. Interesting word of uh, com not completely certain meaning, but it's associated with the, with the reference in the book of Exodus that the angel of God passed over the homes of the Israelites and spared them from the sufferings that were inflicted upon the Egyptians, right? Especially on the last night before the Israelites left Egypt. The Hebrew word is Pesach, Pasach, and it is associated with the Hebrew word which means to skip over or to pass over. But the word has another meaning and uh, it can also mean protect the, the whole, the angel of God protected the homes of the Israelites. So it is, it is associated with an act of protection and grace rather than skipping over. And um, so the holiday of Pesach becomes a central holiday in the Jewish tradition because while Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Shabbat are days of cosmic meaning and personal renewal, Pesach is the beginning of the Jewish people as a free people spiritually and from enslavement. So Pesach is the birth of the nation or of the collective of Israel. The first time that the term Am or people is used is in the book of Exodus, in the narrative that begins to lead to the, to the story of the Exodus. In the book of Genesis, the word people of Israel does not exist. We are tribes, we are families, we are collectives, clans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, in the book of Exodus, Am Israel, the people of Israel. And uh, Pesach is the paradigmatic holiday of Jewish observance even today. More Jewish families observe some form of a Passover Seder than any other observance. It rivals even Yom Kippur. It's kind of the central holiday. It, it has to do, I think, with the uh, substance of the holiday, but it may also have to do with the fact that Pesach becomes in the Christian tradition, the supreme holiday of the Christian uh, faith, right? What, is Pes what does Pesach yield in the Christian tradition? Easter. Easter. And it has many of the associations of Pesach. Pesach is a festival of spring, of renewal, of rebirth. So Easter is the, fest, the feast of the rebirth of Christianity or of the rebirth that made Christianity possible, right? The resurrection. Okay? The death and resurrection. We can parallel that. Christianity parallels that on the Jewish themes of enslavement and freedom. Enslavement, freedom, death, resurrection. So Christianity or Easter, Holy Week and Easter are the Christian midrash, the Christian take interpretation on the origins of the holiday of Passover. So much so that even though it's not 100% clear that that's the case, um, Christians like to link the Last Supper to a Passover Seder, right? The Last Supper of Jesus and disciples with a Passover Seder. Not 100% clear that that is in fact the case, but it's, it's, a, it's a good midrash, good interpretation. So comes Passover, and like other holidays, 
it has a dual nature. It has a historic nature, redemption from Egyptian bondage, freedom, new beginnings, but it is also a spring agricultural holiday. It is the grain harvest. And what do we do before we bring in the new grain into the granaries? We clean up the old grain, we take it out, clean it up. Hence the Jewish practice of cleansing the home from anything that is chametz, anything that is leavened before Passover comes and we bring the, the new Passover grain offering, in this case, an unleavened bread. Biblically, because the Israelites didn't have enough time to allow their bread to rise, they did some quick bacon out of here, right? That's the story of the Exodus. But it's also related to the grain origins of the holiday. And it begins a season of grain harvest. Passover is the barley uh, harvest. And it moves seven weeks later into the holiday that will become known as Shavuot, which means weeks, seven weeks. And the harvest season is completed with the wheat harvest on Shavuot. This is the agricultural season in the land of Israel. But the rabbis associate that with a period of historic experience as well. Passover, freedom from Egypt. Shavuot when we arrived at Sinai and the Torah was received and we became a covenanted people. So the two holidays, seven weeks apart, are linked historically. Freedom from bondage, Passover, Pesach, freedom under Torah. The Torah now becomes the bonding um, uh, constitution, so to speak, of the Jewish people. So Shavuot becomes under rabbinic teaching, the holiday of the giving of the Torah. It is nowhere so stated in the Torah itself, but that's what happened at Shavuot, I mean Shavuot. So there are the three major pilgrimage festivals, as they are called, regalim in Hebrew, because on those three periods of the year, the Israelites would, from the different farms and the parts of the country, uh, the idea was to go to Jerusalem, to go to the temple to celebrate. These were the big uh, in-gathering times at the temple in Jerusalem. So it's a three times of pilgrimage, regel in Hebrew. Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot associated with Jerusalem. Many of the Psalms in, um, in that book, in the Bible, the book of Psalms, celebrate this pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And in the Christian in tradition, Jesus's week of passion and, re and rebirth is connected with the ascent to Jerusalem, right? People come to Jerusalem, uh, and there are many events associated with the temple, often misunderstood and taken out of context in the narrative of the New Testament. Okay, let me pause for a minute. We have Shabbat, the Yamim Noraim, or the High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And now we have the three pilgrim festivals, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot. That's the big ones. Those are the big holidays of the Jewish year. But we have a few other holidays. What other holidays do we have? We have 10 minutes to talk about them. <laughs> What's coming up? Hanukkah. 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 Hanukkah is called a minor festival. That does not mean it is a festival for minors. Which is our other minor festival? Purim. Purim. Good. What is you what makes those two holidays? minor as opposed to major all the others that we talk about are major what because they weren't mentioned in the torah they're after the writing of the torah correct they're not of torah origin now purim at least is in the bible right it's in the book of esther 
in the third section of the Bible, in the Ketuvim story, we derive Purim from a narrative in the book of Esther. Hanukkah is not even in the Bible. It is in post-biblical literature. Um, the narratives of Hanukkah occur in a collection of books known as the books of Maccabees. There are two books of Maccabees with a third and a fourth later editions also known as Maccabees three and four. But the main books are Maccabees one and two, and they're part of the Apocrypha, books that were not included in the Hebrew Bible, although they are to be found in the Catholic canon, in the Catholic collection of the what the Christian tradition calls the Old Testament, right? So Purim takes place in Persia sometime around the fifth century before the Common Era, and it's a holiday associated with a historic moment in the life of the Jews of Persia. Whether fully historic or primarily legendary and anecdotal uh, doesn't matter, but the associations are with the fact that the Israelites in the city of Shushan, the capital of Persia, are spared decimation, and the heroine is a young woman by the name of Esther. That is her Persian name. Her Hebrew name was Hadassah, and she is elected to the harem of the king, and, and, and she persuades him to, uh, to abolish the edict of the bad guy, Haman. It becomes a very carnival-like holiday, festive, so you turn uh, a story that could have been uh, dire and terminal into something celebrational, and behold, when does it happen? February. It's the time when Mardi Gras and, and uh, carnivals are happening around the world. Uh, in, the, in, in the dark of winter, we need some light and celebration. So Purim is kind of our Jewish carnival holiday where we turn things upside down. We just, um, you know, celebrate uh, and turn a, a bad occasion into a time of celebration and thanksgiving. The other holiday, Hanukkah, which is not in the Bible, is even a later, a later uh, observance. It happens in the second century before the Common Era, when the Israelites uh, managed to uh, overcome the um, Greco-Syrian forces in the land of Israel, uh, who had desecrated the temple and imposed um, Greek customs and, uh, and uh, uh, prohibited certain Jewish observances, and there was a great level of, of uh, dissolution of Jewish uh, culture and practice and faith. And the heroes of the holiday are a uh, couple of um, um, young guys by the name of the Maccabees. The head Maccabee is Judah, but the whole thing is started by Judah's father, Mattathias, who was a priest in the town of Moden, Matitiahu Hakohin. He was a priest, and he refuses to obey the orders of the Greeks to bow down to Zeus and leads the beginnings of a rebellion. His sons are the heroic guerrilla leaders who overcome the Greco-Syrian uh, forces, expel them, rededicate the temple. The name of the holiday, Hanukkah, means dedication, rededication, and a festival is instituted in honor of the occasion, and it is called Hanukkah, the rededication. The holiday is referred to um, in rather non-historic ways, more theologically uh, infused ways, in the Talmud, and it is established as an eight-day holiday to remember the, um, the rededication of the temple. Why, according to the Talmud, and this does not appear in the books of Maccabees and the historic narrative, because only one little cruise of oil was found that was enough for one day of lighting the candles, but a miracle of miracles, it lasted for eight days, therefore we observe the holiday for eight days. Right? That's why your Hanukkah menorah has eight candles in addition to the center one, right? But the real reason that Hanukkah is eight days is 
prior to that, and it doesn't have to do with the oil. It has to do with the fact that Hanukkah is a belated Sukkot. Sukkot happened a couple of months before. The Israelites were not able to celebrate it in the temple at that time because the temple was under, um, uh, or at least these, this group of, of um, uh, dedicated uh, Israelites were not able to celebrate it in the temple. So now they rededicate the temple with a celebration of a belated Sukkot. And if you read the in the book of Maccabees, how the event took place, they did it with palm trees and the chanting of the prayers of Sukkot, the Hallel. So essentially, Hanukkah, belated Sukkot, hence eight days. And then interestingly, we find that King Solomon had dedicated the first temple during the holiday of Sukkot. So Sukkot becomes associated with the dedication of the temple. So that's the mystery behind Hanukkah. So Hanukkah is a very popular Jewish holiday. Aside from Passover, the other major observed holiday provides a Jewish antidote to Christmas, you know, um, seasonal winter holiday. It's a little bit ahead of, of Christmas this year. It's more connected to Thanksgiving, which is interesting because Thanksgiving itself is an American expression of Sukkot, the festival of Thanksgiving, when the pilgrims established uh, Thanksgiving and the historic reasons are um, uh, very muddled. Um, but uh, what we do know is that they declared a, a festival of ingathering and Thanksgiving for the harvest, like the biblical festival. So they're all connected to one another. Um, I want to wish you all a happy Hanukkah. The first candle is set for the lighting. Remember your shamash is in the middle. And when you, I don't know how you are seeing this menorah. Where is my first candle? Is it to your right or to your left? Your left. To my left. And we have to turn it. The first candle should be to your right. You begin to light the Hanukkah candles. You first light the shamash. You say the blessing. And then you light the candle. First one. On the second night, you put two candles like this, from right to left, right? From right to left, but you kindle it. So you, you light the shamash, you say the blessing, and then you kindle the lights from left to right, meaning the new candle first. And then the third night you have one here, you kindle it third, second, first. So you kindle the new night first, but you situate them from right to left. So it's very simple. Situate them from right to left, light them from left to right, because you light the new candle first. But if you don't do it that way, it's okay too. Okay, I got to run, uh, but it's good to talk. We have one more session, uh, December something, whatever the, um, that Sunday is. And then the last session, we'll have a conversation on Jewish community structure, organization, and so forth. Um, those of you who are contemplating uh, or interested in conversion to Judaism, uh, will uh, Rabbi Jenny will pick up with you and uh, and move the process uh, forward. But I'll see you uh, whenever the next session is. When is it? Uh, here you are, uh, December fifth. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Have a happy Hanukkah, and uh, take care. Thank you. Bye. And don't forget the recordings are housed on our YouTube channel. They'll be up soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Rebbe. Have a happy Hanukkah, too. Happy Hanukkah. Well,